So on the theme of everything is broken, uh, currently my laptop keyboard is broken. <laughs> and we're going to see if my hotspot holds out because due to a Windows update, I can no longer run any uh, Microsoft applications locally on my laptop. <laughs> so <laughs> I have to run this over the internet. Yay! So, so we're going to see. We're going to see. So already it just hates me. Ah, here we go. So um, there, there will now just be a slight delay with the slides. That's OK. Better than nothing. So uh, my name is Chris Kubeka. And since this is the first time I've ever been in South Africa, uh, most of you probably don't know me very well. But you will after today, because I love meeting new people. So this is fantastic. Uh, but to give you a bit of my background, uh, actually, my area of expertise is cyber warfare. And uh, in, that entails quite a few different things. I handle incident management when it involves nation states. I also advise uh, the EU parliament, the UK parliament, uh, parts of the United States government. And um, I try to avoid, uh, for instance, uh, rockets getting launched when there's a cyber attack, you know. However, on that note, uh, when I was involved with the EU NATO cyber warfare exercises, uh, the night before we had the second day where we got to kill people in the scenario, because, you know, you, you got to have fun with this, right? <laughs> um, uh, the staff and I made a bet to see if any of the countries we were working with uh, would ever consider the nuclear option, and uh, I won the bet. <laughs> I got my countries to uh, consider launching a nuclear weapon in the upper atmosphere of the attacking country. <laughs> right? I'm fun at parties. It's great. It's okay. <laughs> um, but I do a lot of stuff with critical infrastructure. So I see Escada systems, industrial IoT systems. Uh, the week before last, I was at the United Nations doing a workshop. Um, one of Google's uh, external subject matter experts on IoT, and it was for transparency and control of IoT devices. So uh, I love to have fun with all different types of technology, right? I also get bored easily. Don't let me get bored. Then I start like trying to, uh, uh, I don't know if any of you saw a tweet about uh, me discussing getting into the radiation detection monitor for Chernobyl. <laughs> so don't let me get bored. But previous to all this, uh, I headed the information protection group for the Aramco family. I was called in after the 2012 cyber warfare attacks against them that almost uh, took out the country and the company. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. And I ran the network operations, security operations, joint uh, international intelligence groups, and things of that nature. Previous to that, I was in the US Air Force. I was a military aviator and also in Space Command. And now one of my minor claim to fame is I got busted breaking into the Department of Justice and the FBI at the age of 10. <laughs> right? So, ooh, it might be working. So uh, I'm going to take you through an incident that was rather unusual. I'll try not to stand too much in front of the thing. I just like to pace. And this incident started in 2014. It was not a short incident. It actually lasted almost three months, and it took place in The Hague, the Netherlands, which is the business capital uh, and uh, the political capital of the Netherlands. And uh, it involved the Royal Saudi Arabian Embassy and a terrorist group that you may or may not have heard of called ISIS. Uh, it got to the point where it was so bad that several of the embassies ended up having to put a disclaimer on their website uh, that there was an issue uh, involving uh, cybery stuff. So it's a lot of fun now that it's over. <laughs> Let me add that, right? So there's certain reasons why I was chosen to do this because I'm not a Saudi citizen, I'm a US citizen. Uh, so it's rather unusual for a non-Saudi to come in and do the incident management and also be the trusted advisor and the liaison person for the Saudi Arabian Embassy. And one of the reasons was I was already heading uh, the information protection group for the Aramco family. And uh, involved with that, uh, we did a lot of incident responses. Oh, so many. Over beers, if anybody wants to buy me a beer after this, just a hint, right? Uh, my very first week at Aramco, I had my first nuclear incident. So it was a lot of fun, right? 
Uh, I also have a background in forensics, and we had a full uh, forensics lab that had uh, been approved by part of the Dutch government to make sure that we had our chain of custody and we could collect evidence for any criminal matters. So we were all set up to handle a lot of this. Uh, in addition to that, uh, even though sometimes my uh, background with law enforcement can involve handcuffs, it doesn't anymore. Uh, I happen to be one of Europol and Interpol's uh, experts uh, for certain matters. And so I've dealt a lot with different types of law enforcement. Uh, in addition to that, I deal a lot with heads of state, ministers, ambassadors, executives, and never show these people packet captures. Uh, ever, because they will just go, why are you doing this to me? Uh, so I, I do a lot of communications for people like that to translate what's going on for an incident. And at the time, we were having a bit of a problem uh, in the Netherlands. We have this right-wing guy whose name is Hurt Wilders, and he had made some videos, one of which he pretended to rip up the Quran. And that caused a lot of problems to the point where Saudi Arabia itself canceled all Dutch contracts and kicked out a whole bunch of Dutch citizens out of Saudi Arabia. So uh, they did not want anyone Dutch handling this uh, at all. Please work. It might work. It might take a little time. Who knows? There we go. So uh, one thing to remember is an embassy is a sovereign property of a country and regular law enforcement do not apply. Everything goes on the word of the ambassador, him or herself. Uh, everything. You can watch somebody get, or I, I should correct myself, you can hear somebody get beaten to death in an embassy and nothing happens, right? So I'm just putting that out there. I don't know anything about it. Uh, now, uh, embassies do have kind of a police force called the Diplomatic Corps. And they're supposed to just assist with certain matters, uh, but they are not uh, generally law enforcement who arrest uh, embassy and diplomat uh, personnel. And uh, it's quite interesting when you're dealing with an embassy because nothing matters but the ambassador. Whatever he says goes. So I was able to bring my top forensics person in for day one. Uh, unfortunately, because he was Dutch, he had to leave, but uh, we were able to get uh, network packet captures. Now, unfortunately, the uh, embassy in question had no antivirus, right? Um, and we found a piece of malware, which we call commercial off-the-shelf malware. Most interesting about this is uh, this actually ended up involving a nation state, but if uh, you use a custom tool, which usually costs millions uh, for a nation state to develop, uh, the moment that you use it, you're burned. You can't use it again, and they know that it was a nation state. So in this particular case, uh, the commercial off-the-shelf malware uh, was used for plausible deniability. Even though ISIS was involved, uh, the main perpetrator was being controlled by the Iranian government, unbeknownst to him. So uh, this kind of stuff is kind of strange when you're dealing with embassies. Uh, at the same time, oh look, it just went forward. So that's okay. Um, I don't really need slides. So uh, my main office was in The Hague because I chose not to live in Saudi Arabia for various reasons, one of which is, you know, I wear a dress. Uh, and uh, next door to us, even though we were not in the embassy section of The Hague, uh, the Yemeni government purchased a very expensive building with cash. And we suspected that uh, the cash came from the Iranian government. Uh, we also, during this entire time period, uh, there were some unusual activities coming from that particular embassy. Uh, one of which we caught their personnel digging in our backyard trying to get to our fiber to surveil. Uh, another one, we caught them in our building. It's okay, trust me, it's fine. I don't need slides. It'll just distract. Uh, and, and we're all gonna become friends after today, okay? Um, so, because it was coming from an embassy, we had a lot of problems. And we had to also get the diplomatic corps involved. And uh, one day, I like to say, you never forget the first time you're droned. 
during this time, the Yemeni embassy also sent surveillance drones uh, hovering over our fourth floor where our IT section was. And I just so happened to be talking to my boss and uh, he was facing me and I could see the windows and all of a sudden there were drones. Because who doesn't like drones in the middle of the Hague, right? Uh, luckily, uh, they were spoken to and they said, hey, you can fly drones over your own property, but you can't fly it over other properties. Uh, that, that's just, you know, Dutch law. Outside the embassy, no go. So I was attempting to eat lunch one day because this was kind of rare because I had all of these different types of incidents going on. And a very large man in a very nice tailored suit comes to summon me. And I'm like, uh-oh, why am I getting summoned? Did somebody die? Am I getting fired? Uh-oh. Because uh, you always fear those things, right? And he goes, come with me, there's been a problem. And I asked him, hey, wh what's going on? He goes, oh, no, I don't know. Uh, so I speak to our managing director, and he goes, we need to get you to the embassy immediately uh, because there's been a hack. And I'm like, okay, all right, let's check this out. So I get to the embassy, and there's this very nervous IT guy because it turns out it was his very first week, actually his second day, and he got zero handover from the guy before. Right? How many of you have ever been in that situation? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind of nightmare fuel. Um, it's worse than having a nightmare of wearing, you know, no clothes in high school, you know. And I go, okay, what happened? And he goes, well, we picked up that there were some suspicious emails going back and forth uh, under the name of the ambassador's secretary. Now, at the time, the only computer set up to do email or for internet was supposed to be the ambassador's secretary. And I go, okay, well, we'll, we'll check this out. Um, we'll also uh, like change the password of the email system and so forth. What's the password? And he goes, oh, it's one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> Please repeat that because maybe I'm having a little breakdown right now. Who knows? So unfortunately, the business side of the Saudi Arabian embassy was one, two, three, four, five, six. And um, they had no patches. They had Microsoft Defender as their antivirus. And things were not looking good. And so what was happening was there was a Dr. Sumaya, I probably butchered her name, she had uh, emailed the Saudi Arabian Embassy uh, for citizen services and goes, hey, uh, can you help me with a visa? Unbeknownst to her, actually the embassy had stopped helping with visas. There was a third party that uh, dealt with that. Now what she got back in return was an email from the ambassador's secretary saying, hey, I can help you out. If you send me $200 over MoneyGram, in the name of his royal highness, the prince who is the ambassador for the UK. And she's like, huh, this looks strange. I wonder what's going on. So she reported it directly to the ambassador, thinking, is the secretary trying to extort me for money? And the secretary's like, I have never made that email before in my life. So, we went ahead and uh, locked down, or what we thought, locked down the email account because I also, at the time, only had limited access because I'm not a citizen of Saudi Arabia. So everything seems fine. A couple of weeks go by, and then I'm trying to eat lunch again. I almost never ate lunch at this place. And the same very nice man in a large suit, or excuse me, a very a large man in a very nice suit, comes to uh, summon me, and I'm like, great. They have finally found out I have been mining bitcoins. <laughs> they didn't, yes. Uh, so it turns out that there was another email incident. And I'm like, okay, all right, let, let's check this out. So I go there by myself, and this time, uh, an email had been sent from the Saudi Arabian business uh, backend email account to all of the GCC countries in the Middle East and to Turkey, which is not in the GCC, saying, hey, if you'd like to save many lives, please send $25,000, signed ISIS. And you're like, uh-oh, because this was not expected. I guess I didn't need coffee that day, Woohoo! 
So obviously this was causing a, a diplomatic problem because Turkey is not always the friendliest country with Saudi Arabia. And uh, we went ahead and collected evidence from Oman and Qatar. Turkey would not give us evidence. That's fine, whatever. Because we were trying to look at the, uh, the header information and look at various things. So uh, during this time, a couple of days later, the diplomatic corps, without speaking to the ambassador, were trying to be proactive. And they're very nice people. They're, they're very good at their job. Uh, but unfortunately, um, they made a big mistake. Um, the perpetrator was still on the back end of the email, and the diplomatic corps sent an email to all the official uh, back channel email accounts to every single embassy using CC, not BCC, and said, hey, if anybody gets these extortion emails for 25000 go ahead and contact us, and we'll try to help you out. And the next email was from the perpetrator going, well, reply all. Glad that we have your attention. We're going to be raising up the amount. Now, of course, this caused an even bigger diplomatic problem because now every single embassy in The Hague uh, got this notice. And then the perpetrator started taunting the diplomatic police uh, with all of the embassies on copy. Right? Happy days. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, because this was not a short incident and lasted a while, uh, the price started going up. And uh, because I still had, at the time, limited access, we couldn't figure out what was going on. So uh, finally, the ambassador allowed me to take some of the embassy property home with me, because uh, I lived right around the corner. And uh, I was able to find that uh, the perpetrator actually had an email forwarder on the back end of the system. And we went ahead and started locking the perpetrator out. So then I got another surprise during this time because Turkey also got these emails. I used to go to this fantastic little pub called Sherlock's Pub. It was voted the best British pub in the Netherlands. Who knew that was a contest? Uh, it was stumbling dis I mean, walking distance. <laughs> and uh, I arrived one evening because this is, you know, a bit stressful, dealing with, you know, demands from ISIS and this kind of stuff. And there are three people waiting for me at the pub drinking tea, and the owner goes, they've been waiting here for about three hours for you. And I go, uh-oh. And they present their card. They are all cultural attaches from the Turkish embassy. And they have been waiting for me to teach them English lessons. And they spoke perfect English, right? Anyone think that's suspicious? Red yeah, red flag, boo, woo, woo, right? So um, because I was working with various security services during this time as well, they verified that they were indeed uh, embassy personnel. And then I got a bit of a shock after uh, they verified who they were. Uh, then the security services notified me that they had found a top 10 list from ISIS itself, and I was number two. So I was then assigned, I don't like close protection bodyguards, but from a distance to watch me. And then I was advised to engage with them to a certain extent. And so every evening for two and a half weeks, uh, I gave English lessons to English speaking Turkish embassy personnel. So that, that was entertaining to say the least. And uh, in addition to that, on one of our very last uh, lessons, um, the senior person gave me a bit of an odd gift, uh, because I'm not Muslim. Uh, he gave me a set of prayer beads, which I also had security services test to see if they were bugged. You know, don't, don't ever take gifts from a foreign government and not check that stuff out, man. Uh, and then, at the two and a half week mark, they just disappeared, and security services verified that they'd actually left the country. So I never heard from my uh, English uh, lesson students ever again, which is probably a good thing. Now, shortly after, uh, the amb ambassadors started to suspect an insider. Um, some of the reasons for this was uh, the ambassador's secretary's Gmail account was also broken into by the perpetrator. And it started becoming very weirdly personal. And then extortion demands went from 
the 200 to 25,000, 35 million to 50 million dollars. And um, finally, threats started to come saying, you're gonna have National Saudi Day where all of these ambassadors from all these different countries are invited to, parts of the Dutch royal family are invited to, and if you don't give me $50 million, we're gonna blow it up and kill everybody. That's not a good thing. That's when the uh, Dutch uh, National Terrorism Police started getting involved as well. Uh, and uh, The Hague was slowly uh, kind of shut down with a lot of uh, plain clothes uh, police that were completely armed. Uh, all around the embassy sections because this was obviously freaking people out. And because the secretary had gotten these demands to her personal email account, she went ahead and filed uh, a couple of police reports because she was scared, as anyone would be. Uh, but unfortunately, we had to use diplomatic means to have those reports shut down. So as the ambassador started to suspect a particular person, uh, one evening after everyone had left the embassy except for his uh, bodyguards, he started getting down on his hands and knees looking for post-it note credentials because we didn't want the perpetrator to know that he was under investigation. And I've never in my life seen an ambassador looking and sifting through dust uh, on his hands and knees trying to uh, deal with something like this, and I probably never will. So uh, because I was able to get uh, various different types of header information and using uh, information from various ISPs from different hops using diplomatic means to those countries and to those ISPs. I was able to geolocate uh, where uh, some of the emails were coming from and it was the exact neighborhood that the suspect was living in in The Hague. So after uh, we were pretty sure we knew who it was, we then had to deal with the fact that this particular perpetrator came from a very, we'll say, high-born family from Saudi and also had diplomatic immunity. So uh, the ambassador made a decision to relocate that individual to a very physically dangerous location. <laughs> and unfortunately, he was the only one hurt in a car bomb shortly after. <laughs> so um, afterwards, uh, I wrote up my report, uh, which is a very interesting report. Uh, you have to word things very carefully when you're dealing with an ambassador, where you can't say, man, you got pwned because of one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you have to be very nice, very polite, and do a lot of recommendations as well. Uh, but it was a rather thick report with uh, all of the evidence and technical information in the back uh, as well. So uh, shortly afterwards, uh, the ambassador, he had been there for five and a half years, which is a very long time for an ambassador. Usually they've got like a three-year stint. And he was giving his farewell dinner. So he invited me, and I got to uh, sit with all these posh people, with all this posh wine. Unfortunately, I was sick that evening, so I could just smell the wine. I couldn't have the posh wine. But uh, we had the dinner in front of a very du famous Dutch painting called The Night Watchman in the Rijksmuseum, and they had rented it out for dinner. So that was awesome, because it's not like the size of the Mona Lisa. It's like the size of this wall, so it's really cool. And I got a gift from the ambassador. I also had it checked out. <laughs> I don't trust anybody. And um, so we had a lot of fun that evening, and I was just, you know, kind of wowed by all this. Um, but at the same time, uh, the stress of an almost three-month incident was finally over. So that was very good. Now, um, I... Do you want to leave some time for questions? Uh, so I'll kind of end it with some lessons learned. Uh, you never know when a small incident from an email breach could be something that involves geopolitics, depending on your type of business, if you're used as a pivot to get to someone else, uh, or if there's some really dodgy geopolitics going on. Or corruption, that also happens, right? Uh, another thing was, um, I come from a military background, so 
I'm fine with certain types of things, but uh, if you're ever in these types of situations, tell your partner that uh, there might be a problem. Uh, I'm not getting a divorce. And two years afterwards, we had a friendly discussion uh, over what had happened because I, I never talked about it. Uh, another thing is when you're dealing with a major incident, try to keep as, keep as calm as possible and take a deep breath. Uh, what I've seen is a lot of management and executives are going to freak out. I have seen managers scream. I have seen a manager cry. So try to be that strong pillar, take a deep breath and pause and try to calm that chaos because you're the only one that's going to be able to when you're leading an incident. So uh, I will end with that. Uh, thank you very much, B-Sides Cape Town, because yoo -hoo, I get to come to South Africa for the first time. And I'm leaving time for some questions. All right, I'll try to repeat the question when you ask the question. My favorite color is blue. <laughs> There's got to be some questions. I've got one in the back. <laughs> so the question was, uh, what do you think they were trying to achieve uh, through the English lessons, and did I get paid for the English lessons? Um, firstly, we believe that uh, they were trying to distract me and then they were trying to ask various questions about the infrastructure, which of course I did not uh, answer and respond to about the Saudi Ramco infrastructure. And secondly, a few times they did pay me by buying me some pints of beer. <laughs> we'll hack for free beer. I see one back there. Well, it wasn't, how did I uh, hack the Department of Justice? Uh, now, back then, they did not have a website. Uh, I went to a rather unusual school where we had uh, a full computer lab, and I had also been taught uh, various programming languages starting at about the age of five because my mother was a robotics programmer on assembly lines for uh, car manufacturing. And what I did was we had modems and I did what's called war dialing. And back then, if you could get another modem, usually you could get in, or the password at the most was one, two, three, four. So I got in, and I was having fun, and I was looking through reports, and that was kind of cool. I mean, it was text-based, you know, not, not the high tech that we know now. And uh, unfortunately, after about two and a half weeks, uh, after I had first gotten in and I was still looking through things, I had two gentlemen in dark suits standing behind me at my school. So uh, then I was allowed to use a computer again at the age of 18. So, yes. Next question. I got one there. How do you get yourself to stay calm in situations like that? Well, lucky for me, um, I had been through the whole raft of what's called SEER training for the U.S. Air Force, and that's for uh, aviators and people at high risk for being kidnapped or something like that. It stands for Survival, Evasion, Recovery, and Escape, where they put you in a POW camp setting, they waterboard you, they bury you alive, they give you a cute fluffy bunny that you're with, uh, with a lead for a couple of days and you name it and then you beat it to death. So, you know, um, go, go Air Force. <laughs> so th that's one of the things to stay calm uh, is a lot of my military training. I had another question here. How do I stay up to date in what's happening with general security? I have a tendency to get bored. How many of you read about the Boeing story that I've been working on? A few people. So um, I, I still do a lot of uh, very interesting legal hacking, right? I'm being protected by the Dutch government right now and the SEC for that. Uh, I also do training hands-on because I like everything hands-on. And so every time I do a training, uh, I update the material and I learn new things and I teach that back to my students and attendees. So I'm constantly trying to get my hands dirty. 
I, I, I don't have any hobbies except for hacking. Question back here. Uh, <laughs> I didn't care. Uh, which embassy seemed to be the calmest about everything? That would have been the Turkish embassy seemed to be the calmest. Um, and there's certain reasons for that. It's just now coming out in the news that there's a particular relationship between ISIS, um, the oil caravans that were brought from Syria, and Erdogan's uh, son. Next question? One there, and I'll get you next. So should uh, South Africa be concerned with ISIS? And specifically, what should hackers be doing? Um, unfortunately, um, when there's an opportunity, a group like ISIS will try to come in and do bad things. Most recently, we've seen this in Sri Lanka, uh, where they're trying to regroup there uh, because they've lost most of their land um, recently. And we're starting to see uh, various attacks, uh, both them with the bombing, and then now because of the unfortunate issue with religion, there was recently a bus of Muslims that was shot up by a group of Christians. So things are starting to escalate. So they try to get a foothold anywhere they can, or then they work with various more local terrorist type of groups who then get caught up because then there's the promise of money and things of that nature. Now, one of the things that you can do as a hacker is uh, a good hacker, right? We're all good hackers here. Um, some of the things that uh, I work on is when I find certain forms, a lot of these groups are not as technologically skilled as most of us in this room. So they'll have chatter and forums where they don't even encrypt. You can uh, scrape. Uh, you can figure out some of the slang, because I don't know the slang here. I don't speak Afrikaans, for example. Expect Nederlands, not quite the same. Um, and if you start seeing things, try to work with your computer emergency response team who should be able to get the information out. And that's some of the things that you can do. Question back here. All right, I'll try to shorten that. So um, that question was when, when we uh, basically were looking at the initial evidence and seeing what was going on, what other types of hypotheses did we have other than a nation state? We actually first uh, thought that it was just opportunistic because their password was one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, and we didn't think that it was at the level of any sort of nation state at that point in time. So most of these types of things are opportunistic. This one was opportunistic with a whole mix of things going along with it. Next question, because I still have some time. How much time? Aren't you glad my slides didn't work? Yay! All right, so after I was allowed to use a computer again, how did I land in cybersecurity? So two days after my 18th birthday, I bought a computer. Uh, <laughs> I had also been trying to keep up to date with at least magazines and books uh, because it was something that I really wanted to do, especially when you're told you can't do something, <laughs> right? Uh, so then I basically jumped back into it uh, operating systems were different uh, in that eight-year time span, uh, which was fantastic. And then the internet was uh, being available because before you just had closed networks with modems. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. And um, I took the military entrance exam for the US military. I missed one question. So all the services wanted me. And then the US Air Force offered me lots of lovely things. So I've got time for a couple more questions. See one in the middle back. 
how do, how do I get authorizations to talk about things that I just did? <laughs> and, and what's the most interesting thing I left out? Um, well, there's uh, several reasons. Uh, firstly, the incident is now uh, five years old, and all of the parties have uh, been settled, taken care of, car bombed, uh, <laughs> and uh, Saudi Ramco was okay with me giving this talk. Uh, one thing I did actually leave out was we were able to uh, trace the purchase of the commercial off-the-shelf malware that had been used using uh, Bitcoin transactions to a particular wallet that was known to be used by the Iranian government. I saw one back here. Yes. <laughs> Do I think it would look bad on your CV if you worked for 30 days in Turkey? Well, I will tell you when I come over the U.S. border and I've got all of those lovely stamps, they don't like me very much. So I'm just putting that one out there. I've got time for another question. Uh, <laughs> after the Shamoon incident, did Saudi Ramco improve? Yes. Unfortunately, that was short-lived after I left, which, sad hacker face, right? Uh, but they did vastly improve. Uh, before the attack, they didn't even uh, use uh, encryption internally. For example, you could reset your domain admin password over clear text. On a, yeah, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Uh, they had no cybersecurity awareness training. Uh, so then they started putting that out there. Um, and they started really trying to lock things down because they didn't want to get, somebody had put in like the Urban Dictionary a few years ago, don't get a RAM code. <laughs> yeah. So am I out of time? Two more minutes. I have time for one to two questions. Who will buy me a beer tonight? I got to have one more. One more. One here. Uh, so uh, it, it can be kind of difficult to talk to a partner because of the type of job that I do, yes. However, one of the things I should have discussed with the partner was the fact that uh, the partner could have been used as what we call the next hop. So it could have been kidnapped and used against me. Uh, so that was kind of a bad thing. Uh, now that particular person, whenever I uh, am handling a very uh, interesting case, we'll call it, um, uh, then... Um, I notify uh, the partner, uh, and uh, the partner takes certain precautions, uh, seeing if anybody's tailing, uh, doing certain things, uh, changing up routines, and so forth. But uh, because some of the things I work uh, with are under the Official Secrets Act for the UK as well, uh, now that person uh, knows not to ask me very many questions. On time? All right, thank you everyone.